All right, we are at 130 folks uh, listening in. So uh, Alan and I will go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for taking the time to listen to our talk on transformative approaches to whole ebook lending. Uh, my name is Michael Rodriguez and I'm collection strategist at the University of Connecticut. And I'll ask Alan to introduce himself as well. Hi everybody, I'm Alan Jones. I'm the director of digital library and technical services at the new school. Excellent. So today we're basically uh, giving folks a quick overview of the whole ebook lending landscape as we have seen it at our institutions and our consortia. We'll talk a bit about controlled digital lending. We'll talk a bit about a, uh, a pilot project UConn has been doing for, uh, for the past year or two around lending of whole licensed ebooks. Uh, and Alan will talk a bit about some information standards emerging in the field and about project reshare and some other initiatives he's uh, been part of. So just a quick overview of my section of the talk. Um, what I'm focusing on specifically uh, in the context of Yukon's pilot is the lending of whole eBooks that are licensed from publishers. Um, and when we say whole eBook in this context, we're talking about a single PDF, um, all chapters combined into one file that is securely transmitted to the patron without DRM restrictions, utilizing existing systems like Iliad and Odyssey for that purpose. Um, UConn's been lending the whole eBooks under this model since 2019. Um, we've partnered with uh, a fair number of publishers, Brill, Cambridge, De Gruyter, Elgar, Emerald, Sage, Taylor and Francis, Wiley, and others um, to facilitate this process. Um, we're only lending whole eBooks if we've negotiated with the publisher that it's acceptable to do so under the license. And our goal in doing this is really, it's about building a scalable and sustainable model and testing out workflows, absolutely. But it's also about moving the Overton window, about having those conversations with publishers and getting them used to the concept of whole eBook lending and, um, working with librarians as well and uh, increasing the amount of education and awareness and advocacy that we are doing around this topic, which is more critical than ever now in the time of COVID when access to our physical collections is often restricted. Um, what, we're, what I'm not talking about in Yukon's uh, context is controlled digital lending. Um, so a quick overview of CDL. Controlled digital lending is a, a concept that's predicated on the first sale doctrine and on fair use in copyright law. Um, it's not subject to license agreements with publishers. It exists under copyright, not under contracts. Um, but the concept has not been tested in the courts. So it's, it's very much an up and coming application of copyright law. And it's based on a few principles. Um, first, that the library has to retain the print original in their collections. Um, they need to restrict access to the electronic copy using digital rights management software, uh, like Adobe Digital Edition. So people, so the, so the ebook file will expire after a predetermined period and people won't be able to keep it indefinitely or redistribute it. And the library has to limit access to that e-copy to one user per copy. So if you have one print copy in your collections, then you're allowed to lend a digital copy to one person at a time, uh, same as you would the print book. Um, if you're interested in controlled digital lending, I'd encourage you to take a look at the controlled digital lending position statement. Um, it's, I believe it's controlleddigitallending.org. Um, and it's a really thoughtful copyright uh, analysis that has been developed by uh, copyright experts and librarians in various fields. Um, and there's also the opportunity to endorse it, um, to sign a statement of support as an institution or individual. Um, Control Digital Lending's been around a while. It was launched by the Internet Archive in 2006 with their Open Library Initiative. We have had flavors of it emerging in libraries. Um, Occam's Reader, for example, out of Texas Tech in 2013. Um, uh, the silver pilot for streaming videos rather than ebooks, which came out of uh, Carl, uh, Carl, the Colorado Alliance of Research Libraries. Um, Hathi Trust will, does not call its emergency temporary access service controlled digital lending, um, but it is in many ways a flavor of that concept. And since COVID, there have been a lot of efforts to um, 
to do local lending of print course reserve material and so on in electronic format. And you're starting to see conversations emerging around tools like D Digify and Alma D and how those tools can sort of support local efforts uh, to provide course reserves or other high in demand print material in electronic format using CDL. Um, but again, uh, what UConn's doing is not specific to CDL. Alan will talk to you a little bit more about that later. What we're doing is working with publishers to negotiate licenses that allow lending of whole ebooks that we purchase from them. And we do this in several ways when we negotiate. We, we raise this goal whenever we partner with a new ebook publisher. If we're entering into a new license with Cambridge, um, then or uh, Brill or any other ebook provider, this is something we foreground in that negotiation. We see it as a core principle. Um, we time it to coincide with large scale new acquisitions. So if we are if we're looking to buy a ebook collection, that is when we foreground the need to include a whole ebook lending clause. We try to obtain an explicit license clause or written documentation that we are authorized by the publisher to do this, just to remove um, any ambiguity. And we advocate for this every time we meet with vendor representatives. Here's some sample language that we put in our contracts. Um, uh, if anyone's interested, I'll be happy to send you more language directly. But we always try to specify, we include an interlibrary loan clause, the same as you normally would. And then we always try to specify that whole ebooks or full ebooks are permitted. So not just chapters, but the entire book. And then as we talk with publishers, there's an often a natural degree of, of reticence or reluctance to embrace whole ebook lending. They're concerned that it will hurt their bottom line. So in those conversations with publishers, we emphasize that there's very little market impact. ILL has been around for a long time and publishing and ILL have coexisted for a very long time um, without destroying uh, anyone's market. Um, we also explain that this is an opportunity to be a forward thinking industry leader. Um, it's an opportunity to make a sale to us because if we're purchasing an ebook collection or partnering with you on sales, uh, this is a prerequisite for us to do that. We explain why this is a priority for us, why we think it's important that the, the scholarship that UConn acquires for our community, that we can also share that with the rest of the academic community via ILL. We explain what our ILL lending process looks like. Oftentimes vendors really have no understanding of what ILL looks like in the nitty gritty and may have some misconceptions about um, who can use ILL, about how the files are transmitted. Um, so we try to talk through to our process and clear up any, um, any a lack of knowledge or any concerns that they have. Um, we have enough critical mass at this point with our publisher partners that we can start invoking them as examples when talking with other publishers. So for example, if, um, if we've negotiated with, uh, with, um, with Brill, for example, to say that whole ebook lending is permissible, then we can take that as an example to Cambridge or to another publisher and explain, hey, your, your competitor and colleague in this space has accepted this. So that sets a good precedent for you to agree as well. Uh, and we cite parallel industry shifts, like the massive shift toward DRM free that we've seen over the past um, five years or so. Uh, the ILL workflow flow is pretty straightforward. The benefit of this process is it really does not involve any new systems. It just lets us use Iliad and Odyssey and Rapid and other existing solutions for ILL and, and adjust them slightly for eBooks. So this slide kind of takes you through what that looks like. Um, it's fairly straightforward. We do have to do some manual adjusting to the ILL workflow in Iliad. Um, so change um, the request type from, uh, from book to article for eBooks so that we can transmit the PDF. We removed a due date. Uh, the biggest uh, time consumer is actually downloading the whole book from the publisher site because so many publishers provide the book only in chapters. So then we have to download each chapter manually and merge PDF into one file, which can be time consuming if you're talking 20 or 30 chapters. 
Um, this has been a fairly small scale pilot so far. We've lent, a, we lent about 50 eBooks in 2019. Um, but since March, this has, um, the number of requests we've been getting for these has increased exponentially as libraries and users find themselves reliant on electronic, even if they preferred print originally. We're also seeing a concurrent increase in requests for non-lendable books. So books from um, in, in ProQuest or EBSCO or aggregator platforms that we don't have the rights to lend yet. Alan will talk a bit about that. Um, and as I noted earlier, the pandemic really highlights the importance of whole ebook lending given our decreased ability to access or lend physical items. So looking at future directions, I mean, we're continuing to articulate this as a core principle for publisher negotiations. We need to start talking to aggregators and Alan will talk about this, but we need to start working with ProQuest and EBSCO and JSTOR to, to see where we can build whole ebook lending capabilities into those systems and into those sub-license agreements with the publishers they work with uh, over time. Um, because we can't go out and negotiate individual licenses with every single publisher out there. That's not feasible. We have to leverage infrastructure and we have to build infrastructure to support this, even if the flavor is a bit different from what I, I described here. And we also have to advocate and invest in DRM free. I mean, DRM free is, I think, clearly at this point, the patron preferred format. Um, it, and until we have books that are as shareable and portable as their print copies, we really will not have a, a truly sustainable and user engaged ebook ecosystem. Um, and of course, we need to look at control digital lending tools and, and see how we can start building CDL into our ebook landscape at scale, uh, because this is transformative too. This, this can have a real impact on the ecosystem and on how we share and develop our collections. Um, I'm gonna pause there and hand it over to Alan uh, to, take the, uh, to take the rest of the session. And while Alan's getting his slides set up, uh, I'll just say that feel free to ask questions in the chat anytime. We'll try to get to those at the end of the session. Okay, hold on just a second. Uh, can you see my screen? Awesome. So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, um, my name is Alan Jones. It's good to see so many kind of friends in the in the crowd. Um, I want to um, talk a little bit, especially after that uh, um, setup, um, about uh, about some of the stuff that we've been doing. Um, it, not just in the open source space, but also in uh, working with vendors as well. I feel like the setup that Michael gave is, is gracious and humbling at the same time. So the goals for today in this really swift 15 minute uh, sprint is basically going to be to kind of talk about some stuff that we're doing, kind of set the stage. I'm going to geek out for a few minutes and talk about XML and some really kind of scary bracketed stuff. Um, then I'm going to talk about uh, some pilots that are un underway, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how I am really begging and pleading for you guys to get involved. So as Michael was talking about, there, there were a number of uh, um, digitization efforts that, uh, um, as well as uh, infrastructure efforts, that really got started. Um, the early efforts, I mean, back in March of 2000, 2020 or so, um, you know, at least it, through this election, it feels that way. Um, really focused on both the, the kind of Internet Archive and what Hadi Trust was doing, and, and in a lot of ways, that even though it was a flavor of CDL, it wasn't really talking about kind of the connection to inventory management. Some really cool do-it-yourself solutions kind of spun out of that, uh, it, as, I, as Michael was explaining. There's the Iliad workflow that's happening over at University of Connecticut. And by the way, I may, if I may recommend, Michael has done many presentations on licensing and interlibrary loan, and I would highly recommend that you actually look at those because he will take you to school. Um, some of the other uh, uh, solutions have used Google Drive or OneDrive. Um, that's some stuff that NYU is doing. 
as well as uh, SUNY Buffalo working with a solution called File Open, specifically around course reserves. And one of the things that I think is cool about course reserves and this particular solution is that it's actually measuring loans by the hour instead of by the day or by the week. And so SUNY has actually taken this really well-defined circulation problem and they've done a heck of a job in building a solution around that. So the problem is, is that all of these approaches presuppose the, availability, the unavailability of a print collection. So in one way or other, the print collection is, an, is, is not accessible. Either it's not accessible because we can't get to campus or whatever. This doesn't really scale when we reopen. And one of my favorite uh, uh, phrases around this is that, <clears throat> at least with the Internet Archive, they talked about controlled, um, the Authors Guild talked about controlled digital lending as piracy hidden behind the sanctimonious veil of progressivism. And if ever there was kind of a, a, a great phrase to talk about uh, um, publishers at odds with libraries and patrons, I think that pretty much sums it up. The other problem is, is that a lot of the, the solutions that they have are specifically print focused when we've been spending decade, a couple of decades building our electronic process or our electronic book collections. And so even if we do CDL, it still means that there's a whole bunch of this licensed material that's still locked in these kind of unavailable silos to circulate this material. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these approaches. And one of the problems with uh, some of the um, approaches that have been uh, undertaken historically has been that the distribution of PDFs to, to requesters doesn't necessarily calm publishers, DRM free or not. And so what we've tried to do, um, particularly as we talk a little bit about some of the things that are going to be happening in Project Reshare and some of the things I'm going to be uh, talking about with the other pilots is to try to ease some of that anxiety. The other problem is that, um, as I said, uh, things get a lot riskier when we reopen. Um, they also don't contain books that are held on uh, shelves because of uh, copyright risk. And so one of my favorite slides is actually by Brewster Colley from the Internet Archive, who basically shows that even when we're talking about the open library and digitized books, the, the books that have been digitized tend to be pre-1923 or after 1990 when they actually received a grant to digitize a lot of that material. There's this tremendous glut of material that's unavailable that will probably not have ebook surrogates. They're gonna be sitting on library shelves and we need to figure out a way to circulate this material digitally, especially when our, when our students, our patrons, can't get on campus. If there's one thing that COVID has told us, it's that physical access should not stop people from, uh, from gaining access to that information that's on our shelves. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the progress that's been made since tw uh, 2020. So part of the reason that I'm focusing on March, 2020 is because a whole bunch of things started happening. Ex Libris and the rapid ILL acquisition, um, one, one of the things that they kicked off because of COVID-19 was um, different types of, uh, uh, they permissioned in uh, people who wanted to use that network and they found that borrowing of these non-returnables uh, book chapters and otherwise went up over 30% because of the lack of accessibility to this, um, to the physical materials. Internet Archive launched the, um, the uh, uh, National Emergency Library. Hadi Trust um, launched theirs. Um, Reshare also had the uh, uh, returnables um, borrowing network that was beginning to catch speed. Um, the uh, Control Digital Lending uh, white paper was published then. So there was a lot of activity. Sharing was basically in the air. The problem was Vendors and publishers were somewhere out in the, in the ocean somewhere. They weren't actually involved in all of this sharing activity. And so part of what I think that I'm gonna be talking about is 
how do we actually bring that back together so that we're, we're doing this in a way that's safe and palatable for publishers, but at the same time, um, usable for our library patrons. So as I said, um, Project Reshare is something that I'm affiliated with. It's the uh, uh, Returnable Borrowing Network. We've also recently published with the Stanford Libraries as well as the Internet Archive um, to really begin thinking not just about returnables, but about this controlled digital lending process. At the same time that all of this is going on, the core bedrock of what it is that Reshare is based on is this really arcane uh, information standard called ISO 18626. What this basically is, is it's, it's a, a replacement network protocol for interlibrary loan or for interlibrary loan systems and ILS systems to speak to one another about lending and borrowing uh, transactions. Meaning that using XML and, and standard internet uh, um, protocols, we're able to support the exchange of returnables, non-returnables, and digital loan messaging. So this basically looks something like this. If I were to talk about this in plain speak, do you have this book? That's row one. The, the supplier says, yeah, I heard you. Yes, I have a book. I'll send it to you. I heard you. Here's the book. It's checked out to you, and it's due back on 2020, uh, the last day of the year. And then the uh, receiver says, I heard you. When on the return trip, I got the book, the, the supply or the uh, lending library says, I got the book. Supplier says, I heard you. My patron's done with it. I'm should make it back now. I heard you. I got the book back. You're off the hook. I heard you. And so what we started to realize when we started thinking about these network protocols was that as far as CDL or ebook lending goes, it's just a non-returnable with a due date. And when you, when you begin to kind of think that maybe this, this is, we already have the tools to basically build this type of infrastructure, whether it's ebook lending or whether it's the CDL thing that we're all talking about, what might that look like? Well, that might look something like this. Do you have this book? Yeah, I heard you. Yeah, I have this book and I'll send it to you in an EPUB format. You'll see that in red there. I heard you. Here's the book. It's checked out to you and it's due back same day. I heard you. That's it. There's no return trip. It expires. It's done. It's over. So we have the message standards and information protocols to do this whole ebook lending. The procedures for recall and renewal are already baked into the protocol, so we don't have to start reinventing the wheel. Yes, it hasn't been legally tested, but we believe that it's sound in terms of its, uh, in terms of its legal standing because of the right of first sale that Michael was talking about. There's, there's a hook or a link with the inventory management system so that if the book is checked out to a digital patron, the circulating copy doesn't go anywhere. So that piece has already been built and is already working within Project Reshare. So digital rights management, at least for this minimally viable candidate, then is a completely separate problem. And there are many different places that we can go. Michael talked about the Adobe Content Solution, which is crazy expensive. Um, there's some of the stuff that's going on with File Open, which I talked about, the SUNY Buffalo thing. Lock Lizard has a version of DRM that's $6,500 a year. There's other places like Vitrium or Library Simplified and Simply E if you're interested in the open source versions of this. So how this basically works is this. You have a PDF, it's delivered. When the, when the patron opens that PDF, there's a license request to the license server and a license is received. That license then, hold on a second, can basically tell you what types of, of things you can and can't do with that PDF object. So the other nice thing about it is that the license server can actually go to your identity management system and it can actually say whether you're a trusted user or not. So all of this basically coming together is to say that for project reshare um, and, and uh, CDL, 
a lot of these workflows are already built. The real-time availability check, associating document links with, with requests, delivering these access details in our patron messaging, and handling these expired requests are already things we do with physical materials. So while, real, while ReShare deals with the communications and the physical inventory management and the delivery communications, it doesn't necessarily address this issue of licensed or um, owned locked uh, material that's locked in vendor platforms. What if a vendor provided a link to a trusted access site where the, le with the, where the lending institution could send that link to a requesting institution to grant external access to the lending institution's licensed content? In other words, if I have a five user license and somebody from Temple wants my thing, then I should be able to issue that license out. That's what whole ebook lending is, or what I'm kind of very funnily calling uh, Weeble. Within, within a whole ebook lending, a patron can request another institution's ebooks, and a lending institution can provide a requesting library with an access token that would allow them to open a single copy of that ebook. Now, it just so happens that there's, a, there's an aggregator that's crazy enough to actually do this. Now, the other thing that I wanted to mention was, do you remember that whole thing where we were talking about um, the ISO 18626 standard? This is already covered within that standard. So we already have interoperability potentially baked into this. ProQuest is actually interested in at least beginning to think about what this type of transaction might actually look like. We're going to do it really uh, um, scoped. It's going to be something that happens all within the eBook Central um, platform. But we are crazy enough to try to look for uh, both publishers as well as libraries who are interested in actually doing this. So what you see here then are the key insights that we want to uh, achieve. One of the big things is expanding the community beyond just the library and the patrons and the, the licensor to include publishers as part of that conversation. We want to hear about the anxieties around this type of lending. So again, we believe that we have to grow the community with this Weeble thing. We have to have the aggregators who are actually willing to undergo the development costs of building this type of interlibrary loan mechanism. We have to have libraries, both large and small, your R1s, as well as your really small two, four-year institutions, to try to figure out what the behavior is for net lenders and net borrowers. We need to have publishers at the table, software vendors, consortia. All of these different stakeholders need to be involved in this. So one vendor is not going to be able to provide an end-to-end -end solution for all of these requesters, suppliers, or ebook providers. And so the solution that we're looking at is going to be much more component-based. Some will be DRM, some will be discovery, delivery, inventory management, request handling. Some may even include licensing of ebooks. And these solutions won't necessarily be perfect. We're not going to be digitizing preservation-ready TIFFs. Uh, or uh, um, PDFs to capture this data, and we're going to be making um, mistakes. That's okay, as long as we can figure out how to do the loan. This is a very access-driven strategy. So if you're a library, one of the ways that you can be involved is you can check out the manifesto at the controlleddigitallending.org. You can also engage your general counsel to assemble a position on CDL. The website of Controlled Digital Lending talks about how you might be able to do this with your general counsel's office. Get involved in the community, the mailing list, the discussion list. If you're an aggregator, speak, begin speaking to your institutions about whole ebook lending with your licenses, exactly the same way that Michael's been doing. Understand how customers lend interinstitutionally and what guidelines they use to define limits. Do they pay copyright? Do they not pay copyright? Do they, do they not loan on the sixth loan? Do they not loan on the 10th loan? What's their level of risk? Learn how institutional lending is part of, your, part of their fulfillment mission, not necessarily part of your budget strategy. It's important to, to think about the revenue, but also think that the mission of the library is to share this information, not just with its patrons, but with a broader audience to support scholarship. And also understand that 
fiscal shifts are beginning to move away from collection building to these types of demand-driven services. Finally, if you're a publisher, there's a really great article about the digitization and the demand for physical works, um, specifically around the Google Book Project. And one of the things that the authors found was that some of the revenue that was, you know, that for some of the skittish publishers, they actually found that sales for some of these titles increased by as much as, as 35% because they were exposed through the Google Books, Books Project. You can participate in discussions with my uh, colleague at arms, Whitney Murphy, I've got her contact info here, or other customers with, uh, within the whole ebook lending. You could also offer back files or low risk things that aren't necessarily your front list material to aggregator studies like what we're doing in ProQuest. So I think no matter where you are in this supply chain, everybody can do something. So with that, I'm gonna leave it up for questions. Wow, nothing. Uh, Dan Huang, of course it's gonna be Dan Huang. Um, my only issue with this is that I want to eventually purchase the ebook my e users are borrowing. Will reshare facilitate? Reshare might, reshare may not. But one of the nice things about the aggregator being on the other end of that link is they'll be able to tell you how many times you interlibrary loan that book. So whether this is something, for example, uh, did I really think you were going to be quiet? No, I didn't. Um, one of the nice things about the aggregator being on the other side is this could easily be a data point for something like Rialto. It could easily be something that's a data point for Gobi or for Oasis or whatever your selection tool is. So part of the thing that I think is the most interesting and most compelling with this ProQuest uh, uh, pilot is we're getting data when, when, we, when we haven't had it in the past. And not only are we getting the data, but the aggregators are getting the data as well. So we can, we can really begin to see where is that stretch point? Is it, like I said, at five loans? Is it at seven loans? Is it at 10 loans within a year? We'll be able to figure this out. Um, Will ProQuest integrate their ATO logic into this process? Um, I think those are the types of things that are up for discussion, Dan. Um, one of the things that I'll also say about this is all we wanna do is make sure that we can loan something once. We basically wanna figure out what our proof of concept is. And our proof of concept is actually pretty easy. Can we issue a URL to a user at another institution um, and then two weeks later, expire that item. Um, and then after we expire that item, um, you know, kind of uh, figure out uh, what kind of data we actually get from the behavior of that thing. So. Um, it looks like there are a couple of questions on the Pathable site as well. Um, so Kimberly asks uh, if UConn has ever stepped away from a license or purchase because a vendor will not agree to whole ebook lending. Um, so far, we haven't had to. Um, we have been in sort of lengthy conversations that took a year to get to a license, but to, before we were able to start doing business with that publisher uh, um, under a license that allowed whole ebook lending. But no, we haven't. Uh, we haven't had a situation where we've had to walk away. Um, what is more challenging is if, if when we approach publishers that we're already in long-term business relationships with, and we want to sort of change the basis of that relationship by interjecting whole ebook lending. And those are ongoing conversations, but we try to steer our investments toward publishers that provide the most rights and the most flexibility possible. Are we looking for libraries to participate in the ProQuest pilot? If so, how do we get involved? Um, I, I think we have our initial cohorts um, set up. 
but I would email um, if if you get the slides, we have our contact info that you that we can pass on to ProQuest. Or I think there are also uh, uh, email addresses of of Whitney Murphy, who's my comrade in arms in this. Yeah, and Dan, your comment in the pathable chat is is right on point. Yeah, that's. It's sort of what I was saying around steering our investments toward uh, publishers that do the right thing, basically, to collaborate with libraries and partner with us to move the ecosystem forward. Um, so yeah, I think that is, that's definitely a shared approach where we, we, want, where we refuse to invest in ebook packages that don't align with, with these principles. Um, Amanda, that is a good question. So do any of these projects envision using other types of content such as video? Um, yeah, the Silver out of the Colorado Alliance of Research Libraries, they actually worked with Alexander Street around a very similar token-based uh, streaming video lending process. Um, so I think they've published some papers about that. You, you may want to do some research and uh, uh, and investigate that further. But yeah, there's definitely, a, there's definitely been a pilot out there that has tackled exactly that. Uh, and we are a bit over time, so we should probably wrap up in just a couple of minutes. Um, looking at the chat. Hey, Laura, I think you're right. Uh, it is probably easier for institutions with with um, with large budgets to negotiate whole ebook lending with publishers. Absolutely. I mean, the more money and business you're bringing to the table, the greater the leverage. Um, I think there, if possible, would that would be an opportunity to work with your consortia and um, and see if this can be foregrounded at the consortial level and mm -hmm. and a consortial license is negotiated. I mean, a couple of our licenses have been through Neural and um, we've had some some good success working with publishers um, through consortia as well. And Alan, I'm sure you've had a similar experience. Yeah, I mean, the, the consortia route is is definitely the one with the most cost cost savings. But I also think um, that's actually an area of, of real experimentation. If you can take kind of a, a existing borrowing network of returnables, for example, and then turn that into um, exchanging eBooks, I think the amount of data that you can get out of that would be absolutely phenomenal. So I'm also seeing in the chat that Laura West is saying that you could definitely email Whitney. She's her, she put her email address in the chat. So if that's something that you uh, are interested in getting more information on, you can certainly reach out to Whitney. I'm sorry for all the emails you're gonna get Whitney in advance. <laughs> yeah, in, in some ways um, sort of having a, um, being a smaller institution can almost be a benefit potentially because it's lower stakes for the publisher as well. They may be, they may be less concerned about putting a lot of, of their eBooks into the wild if you're, a, if you're a smaller institution that maybe has less lending volume. So that's also a possibility. Yeah. Yeah, I think we should probably pause there and I mean, absolutely, Alan and I are, are happy to, uh, to respond to any emails or questions uh, after the session. Absolutely. So thanks everyone for attending our session. And if there's anything else that you'd like to follow up with, you can either email us or uh, the slides will be available on Pathable. Thanks.